Moment done. Thanks, brother. Happy birthday. Have a good one. Um, so like I said, we are in part three of our sermon series in the book of Ephesians. Um, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Uh, there's a lot that I couldn't cover in the first gathering because uh, of time constraints. Um, I'm going to attempt to cover them now, but keep it within the time slots. Don't worry, don't panic. Uh, if you've put something in the oven, uh, it will not get burnt in the name of Jesus. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to get a little bit more uh, than the first gathering. And so if you're wondering, should I come? Yes, absolutely. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 11 to 22 is where we will be. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, I said this last week, is one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament. It has shaped and molded not only my identity in Christ, but also my ministry. A ministry that believes that God is forming for himself a family from all people, a diverse community. What we here at Rooted Fellowship have come to know as a transcultural family. We hear this all the time. Every Sunday, someone comes up and, and gives a definition of what transcultural means. And sometimes it's in different variations. But let me give you the exact definition this morning. You see, to be transcultural is to have a view of community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context. And by the power of the gospel, transcend it to create one community in Christ. Now, hear me, friends. I believe in this definition. I, I believe in it and, and, and I also am pursuing it because I believe it captures the essence of Ephesians chapter 2. Well, let me explain by reminding you of last week's message where last week we unpacked in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 the gospel. Here Paul kind of says, here's who you were before you met Jesus. And then he says, but God, rich in mercy, extends his hand of grace towards you and pulls you out of the death valley. And so now you are a new creation in Christ. He reminds the church in Ephesus of the beauty of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he came from heaven to live among his creation. He lived the perfect life that you and I should have lived, died the death that you and I deserve. And the story doesn't end there because the tomb is empty. He is resurrected that right now Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He intercedes for us and we believe in the beautiful truth that one day he will return to make all things new again. The beauty of the gospel. John says it this way in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave. He gave His one and only Son. And so friends, this is the good news for all of those who will believe. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 beautifully captures this. It tells us that it's by grace that we've been saved. See, Paul recognized this in his own life. And he wanted the church in Ephesus to realize this. He wanted them to see the wonder of God. The wonder of God. He, he wanted the, the church in Ephesus, he wants us here today to be awakened to the wonder of God that is in Jesus Christ. But then he transitions. It's like he's saying, guys, I'm not done yet. I'm not finished. He transitions and he says, if we are going to be awakened by the wonder of God, know this, it has implications on our lives. It has implications on our lives. And one of them in particular is that it presses us to see and experience God's transcultural community. It presses us to see and experience God's transcultural community. Why? Well, simply because good news brings people together. Good news brings people together. And we know this, friends. We know this. Many of us have attended weddings where we show up and we know the bridal couple and uh, you know, we know one or two people. But by the time the reception kicks in and the dance floor is open, we are partying and dancing like we are family. Why? Because good news brings people together. Friends, I, I believe this is one of the reasons that South Africa made the assumption, made the assumption 
that after the 95 World Cup and then now recently when South Africa uh, won its third title in 2019, after winning that, seeing people cheering and hugging all together from different backgrounds, we assume that now we're healed. Because good news brings people together, people from all walks of life. And, and so we saw that, and I understand why, but it was a mistake to think, ah, now we are healed. I mean, think about it for a moment. It's ridiculous to, to put that which God has given to the church as, as his messengers of reconciliation, his ambassadors of the kingdom of God, to put that to go as the church, oh, skip past to 20-something-year-olds playing an 18-minute game, hoping that they'll win because that is what will heal our nation. Maybe we'll slap a really cool hashtag on there as well. It, it, it's, it's ridiculous as the church. Now, I'm not against the Springboks. I may not support them, <laughs> but deal with that because I'm not South African, but it's okay. But, but I love the Springboks. I love Sia Kulisi. I love his story. I love all of that. But friends, that is not what will reconcile us. Only the gospel can. Because good news brings people together. And really good news will bring even strangers and foreigners people who look different, think different, vote different, together. And as the bride of Christ, as the church, I believe we have the greatest news to have hit the face of the earth right here in our possession. The good news of the gospel, bringing people together, regardless of ethnicity, culture, and socioeconomic background. Paul's ministry beautifully displayed this. We read it over and over and over again. It beautifully displayed this. Jesus would, uh, uh, Paul's rather, would show up from town to town, city to city, region to region, and he would ask two questions. Where's the synagogue? And where's the marketplace? Where's the public arena? Where are those who think they are Christians because they observe the law? And then where are those who want absolutely nothing to do with Jesus? And he would go there and he would preach the good news of the gospel. And people would come to Jesus. They would surrender their lives to Jesus. They would cross the line of faith. And then he would go, okay, great. Now that you are Christians, I'm putting you in one community. See, the temptation, the temptation would have been to create two different communities. A Jewish one and a Gentile one. But it makes sense. You want to grow something quickly? Get people who think the same, vote the same, dress the same, and you will grow that thing quick. Make a church like this. But he doesn't do that. He goes, because you've been awakened by the wonder of God, and that good news brings people together, you are now a transcultural community. I'm putting you in one space. He doesn't start two churches, but he puts them in one community. Why? Well, verse 11 gives us the reason. Let's read it. So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised, by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. Let's keep reading. At that time, you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. He's speaking to the Gentiles, but then he says, but now. Remember, this is who you were, but now that you've been awakened to the wonder of God, but now... In Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh, he made of no effect, effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. He says, once, once upon a time, you were far, far from the promises of God, alienated from the kingdom of God. But because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, you're now in. He gives us the gospel in verse 16. He says, he did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the, the hostility to death. He says, Here, here's how it happened. Here's how it's made possible. Then in verse 17, he says, He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away, that's the Gentiles, and then peace to those who were near. At this point, all the Jewish folks are now holding on to their seats going, excuse me? Well, that's because just because you're Jewish doesn't mean that you're in. You were near, but you weren't in. 
This is a danger that many of us, many of us can fall into just because you grew up in a Christian home, just because you've gone to Sunday gathering after Sunday gathering after Sunday gathering. It doesn't mean that you're in. You've got to surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Only that gets you in. And so he says, those who are far and those who are near, because of what Jesus has accomplished, you're both in. Verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. They've been awakened by the wonder of God, and now they're pressing in and experiencing God's transcultural community. Friends, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 and 16, Paul uses intentional language to explain why the church is and should be transcultural. He talks about uh, the war that existed between Jew and Gentile, which in that time when he wrote this was a great illustration because it made absolute sense to them and it spoke into their culture. See, the temple back then where people would go to worship God had a dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. In fact, it had multiple divisions, but we'll get to that in a moment. It had a dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. And on these walls were inscriptions in Latin and Greek forbidding Gentiles to enter into the space of Jews. In fact, you were told that if you cross this line, you will die and it'll be your own fault. And and in fact, there's a piece of this wall in Istanbul, in Turkey, in a museum, if you want to go see it. If you're sitting here and you're going, "Mm, I don't really know, you can buy a plane ticket and go and see it for yourself. It'll be an expensive trip, but if you're not wanting to believe what the scriptures say. It was a real wall. And so Paul says, Jesus' death and resurrection has demolished this wall, allowing Jew and Gentile to worship and live together. But hear this, friends, we know this, that that wall actually exists in our hearts. That physical wall, the real wall, represented the wall that exists in our hearts before coming to Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2 Verses 1 to 10 tells us that Jesus' death and resurrection demolishes the wall that exists between us and God. So we are reconciled back to the Father. But there is an implication of that. That the wall of hostility that exists between one another, that's also been demolished. And it happens here so that it might happen out here. But sadly, we know in this nation, and I I would go as far as to say, Even in the church in this nation, we've done a pretty good job of trying to rebuild this wall. It was Martin Luther King Jr. who once said that the most segregated time in America is the 11 o'clock hour on a Sunday morning, referring to the Sunday gathering. Friends, this was over 50 years ago, but I believe that that statement still rings true today in many of our churches. Paul says that in Christ, a new community has been formed, has been created, something that had never been seen before. Jew and Gentile coming together under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And in Paul's day, the only place where you would see that was in the church. Folks would be walking past, minding their own business, and then see a church gathering and go, what on earth is going on here? These people shouldn't be together. And not only are they together, see, it's more than just proximity, but the gospel leads to propinquity. It's a real word. I didn't make it up. Go look, go look, go look for it. It's real. It, and, and it's similar to proximity, but it speaks more of what proximity can do. It's more than just being physically close to one another. We celebrate the fact that we can sit next to people who look different to us, who think different to us, who vote different to us, but we've got to do life with them. The church was the only place that you would see this. It was a powerful demonstration of the gospel, a powerful witness of the good news. And so if this is true, it leaves us having to ask the question, in our first service said, it's pronounced homogenous. Is that correct? I'll take it. You said it confidently, so there we go. Homogenous. It leaves us asking the question, in our homogenous circles of comfort, because that's what it is, are we becoming a hindrance to the gospel? 
are we failing to display the beautiful picture of the church, who she is meant to be, what we see in Revelation chapter 7? Now I know, even as I say this, that there are many hearts here that are going, Oni, I hear you. I've probably heard you preach a similar sermon to this over the years, but I'm just tired. I'm weary. I'm hopeless. I don't know if it's possible. I'm looking at our history. I'm looking at our current, present reality. I just, I, I, I don't know if this is even possible in our context. And what we do is we, we look to the other side. Let's be honest. We look to the other side. And that other side could be white, black, colored, Indian, rich, poor, formally educated, informally educated. The list goes on and on and on. And we go, it's, it's them. They just don't want to. They're just unwilling. I get that. I'll be honest. I sometimes find myself in that space. That many of us are dealing with trauma because of what's happened to us in pursuit of this. And what do we do with our trauma? We bring it to Jesus. We bring it to Jesus because he he heals, he restores, he reconciles, he understands, he pours grace and mercy over us. I, I get it. And as the church, we're supposed to do that. This is why we make our trauma known to one another. We don't live in, in isolation and go, everything is fine. Meanwhile, internally, you are breaking. No, we bring our trauma to Jesus. But what we don't do with our trauma is use it as, as an excuse to be disobedient. Oh, God, I don't do this because look what happened over here. And so I get it. Many of us are, are left going, I, just, I, I don't know if I can trust the people uh, in my space. I don't know if I can trust the process. And so, on if you're saying this to us and saying it's from the scriptures because good news brings people together and, and you understand our context, then, then what? Then how? The answer will always be the same. In fact, the answer is the same for every situation. The gospel. The gospel. The gospel must be our solution for everything. Uh, look, here's, here's why I think many of us, we won't verbally say it, but we say it in our hearts and our actions reveal it. We've given up on the gospel. Here's why. See, I believe we have a simple gospel for salvation and a complex gospel for sanctification. Let me say that again because it's quotable. We have a simple salvation or a simple gospel for salvation and a complex gospel for sanctification. Let, let me explain it this way. Jesus on the cross, on either side, thieves. The one mocks Jesus the entire time. The other starts that way, but then looks to Jesus and goes, hold on, There's something different about this man. And in that moment, recognizes his depravity. And so he cries out, and, and he's like, I'm in desperate need of a savior. What does Jesus say to him? Uh, okay, okay, I'll, 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 I'll give you the answer. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And because I believe Jesus, where is that man? Right now in this moment, where is he? In paradise. Did that man complete a course on the doctrine of justification? Did that man attend a Bible study? Did that man go on a mission trip? Did that man volunteer to serve at his local church? Now, you might go, yes! Arne has just given me reason not to do any of those things. No, 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 no. Those things are important in our growth, in our maturing, in us becoming more and more like Jesus. But friends, they don't save us. What saves us is surrendering our lives to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Done. We have a simple gospel for salvation. And we've tried to complicate it. We've added all these different things that will not save us. But having said that, friends, we have a complex gospel for sanctification. Now, what is sanctification? Well, it means to be set apart. That God is molding us and shaping us to become more and more like his son, Jesus. 
And so we get into community so God would mold us and shape us. We get plugged into a discipleship group so God would mold us and shape us. We give and we serve. We gather together so God would mold us and shape us. And for that we have a complex, not a complicated, but a complex gospel for sanctification. And that complex gospel has the ability to engage in our different complex situations as we press in to see and experience a transcultural community. That's why we cannot say, you know what, this situation is way too difficult. There's nothing that can happen here. No, no, no. We have a complex gospel that engages in that. Let me show you a few places in the Bible where we see that particularly around the area of a transcultural community, God forming a family for himself from all people. First place is, is, is in the different churches. See, Paul writes to the various churches, and what he's doing is he's addressing the issues that come up in those churches. And many of them have got to do with doctrine and theology and heresy and the gospel, but they, they come from cultural differences. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We see right out the gates already division. Paul addresses the division in the church. And that division has come up because of the different leaders. Folks are going, no, 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 I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. Now, at first glance, you might go, okay, these are just names. They're people that we know, and they did some amazing things. But no, we need to double-click this to see that this is a massively cultural issue. See, Paul, Paul was a Jew. He calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee, but he was also a Roman citizen. Now, to give context to that, whatever country you think is the greatest nation in terms of what they have and what they have to offer and protection and so forth, it's like possessing a passport for that nation. Paul, a Roman citizen, was a big deal, but he was also a Pharisee, which means that he was highly educated in the scriptures. And so whenever he spoke, I mean, it was eloquent, it was amazing. I mean, we see some of his sermons here. He just killed it time and time again. Epic, beautiful language. Peter, no, he was blue collar. I mean, he was a fisherman, an everyday guy. Used everyday language, probably the slang of the day. And so folks in the church who resonated with that would always go, yo, I get what Peter says. But Paul, hey, this higher grade Hebrew, I don't understand what he's saying, but but Peter, Peter's my boy. Peter, I get. And so they would roll with Peter. Apollos. Acts 18 tells us that he was a Jew, but he had a Greek name. How come? Well, he was a Hellenistic Jew, which means that he was part of the diaspora, that he, he grew up in Greek context. In fact, it's most probable that his mother tongue was Greek, but he was a Jew, which means that when he spoke Hebrew, he probably spoke it with an accent. Again, people in the church going, why does this guy talk funny? I mean, he's speaking our language, but what is that? Why does he have a twang? And so what you have in the church is people going, well, I'm with this person, I resonate with this person, I res... Paul does, what he does in, in chapters that follow that, in chapter 3 of the same book, he goes, guys, listen, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether, whether I planted or Apollos watered, what matters is that it's God who gives the growth. And so friends, we need to be careful. We need to be careful when we make some, some of the statements that we make. It's like, oh, I don't understand what he's saying just because they're from a neighboring country. But you bring a Frenchman up here, which we kind of did. We brought an Irishman who grew up in France, but still had an accent. Then all of a sudden, oh, beautiful. I understand everything he says. Just, just examine your heart. That's all I'm saying. Examine your heart, that you are not trying to rebuild walls in your heart that the gospel has demolished. So issues of leadership came up because of cultural differences. Issues of food came up. Remember, Jew, Gentile, Paul puts them in one community. So you can imagine on a Sunday gathering, maybe there's a, a Jewish guy, he's ushering people in, that's kind of his role and his responsi responsibility, and, and then a group of Gentiles walk in and he, he goes, why do you guys smell like bacon? And they go, hey, uh, well, before we showed up to the Sunday gathering, we stopped at a you know, quick restaurant and uh, grabbed some uh, breakfast and on there was bacon on top of bacon on top of bacon. And they're like, oh, you're one of those people. And they kind of let them in and like, can you guys sit over there because of that smell? Could you guys sit over there? It was an issue. We know that Jesus came. His death and resurrection, it, it, it doesn't necessarily abolish the old law, but it, but it fulfills it. It completes it. And so in Christ, there is freedom. How does Paul address this cultural issue? He goes, well, guys, I understand that 
that you're concerned because the, the Gentiles used to, used to sacrifice and killing the animals, sacrifice to this false god and then they would cook the food and then eat it, right? But now that they've crossed the line of faith, now that they are in one household, that they're Christians, well, they're no longer sacrificing to false gods but they're still eating the food, right? And everyone's like, yeah, 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 yeah we get that. Then Paul's like, well, then let them eat the bacon. Let them eat the bacon. In fact, he goes on to say, guys, here's the thing. Just don't cause your brother or sister to stumble. You're looking for a principle? There it is. It's the second commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, so maybe you, you see some, some Gentiles who've just come to faith. They're really young and, and they're just kind of wrestling with this. Hey, be patient with them. Pull them in. Get them in a discipleship group. Get them in a family group. Walk with them. Get them to realize what's going on here, the implications of the gospel. Maybe there's some, some young Jew, Jewish guys who've just come to faith and they're still holding on to the law. Hey, get them to realize that it's not about the law anymore. Pull them in. Walk a journey with them. Don't cause one another to stumble. It's a cultural issue. We see uh, issues of festivals and holidays in Colossians chapter 2. Like, like which one do we follow? The Jewish folks going, hey, we, we, we used to practice the Passover. But now that we know in Christ, hey, that's not necessary anymore. But hey, Paul, can we still do it in remembrance? Absolutely. But don't force the Gentiles to do it and make them believe that they're not Christians unless they do it. Don't do that. Don't rebuild that wall. It's been demolished. You are now one family, one transcultural community. A complex gospel that sanctifies, that meets us where we are. Another place that we can go to is Galatians chapter 2. If you're familiar with this passage, I'm pretty sure you're holding on to your seats right now. Because this is where Paul publicly rebukes Peter for racism. Now, I know you might sit here and go, on it. Um, <coughs> it's not racism. I'll go, oh, why'd you say that? Well, it's because <coughs> we are one human race. I go, okay, cool, I get you. And if that's you, that's fine. Just hang on, right? Stay with me. I'm going to answer that towards the end. And if I forget, someone just yell racism at me. And I'm pretty sure it'll jog my memory. If not, it'll be pretty entertaining. Galatians chapter 2 from verse 11. It says this, but when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he was doing was wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile. Why are you not trying to make these Gentiles follow Jewish tra traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. A couple things I want to bring up here. Number one is we see that Paul confronts Peter to his face in the presence of others. Now I'm not trying to make an absolute application here. But what I believe the Bible is telling us is that there are situations where we have to confront people to their face in the presence of others. You see, Peter wasn't just somebody. Peter was a leader in the church. In fact, Peter was an apostle in the church. And, and, and what is Ephesians 2 say about apostles. I just read it, but let me read it again. Ephesians chapter 2. I'll just read it from the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Paul says this. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. See, Paul recognized that as apostles, they were building foundation. 
And so he goes to Peter and he says, Peter, what you're doing, what you're doing is going to have a massive impact for the generations to come if we lay this down as a foundation. I'm sure some of you have heard this in conversation. Maybe you've even said it yourself when talking about institutions and, and organizations and schools, whatever it is, and, and you go, you know what, this thing just, it can't be renewed, it can't be transformed. It wasn't, it's not broken, it was built this way. The point you're making here is that, is that we could paint the walls, we could change the aesthetics, but the issue is the foundation. We need to deal with the foundation. And so, and so Paul here says, Peter, we're laying foundation and we cannot lay this. What you're doing here, we cannot lay this because it will have impact, a massive impact for the generations to come. In fact, we're told here that he's leading others astray, even Barnabas, Barnabas, the son of encouragement. So he confronts him to his face in the presence of others. Friends, many of us are going to have to pray to God that he would give us power, resurrection power, to be able to confront people to their face in the presence of others. And I know that's not easy. That's why we need resurrection power. Second thing I want us to see here is that Paul, a Jew, confronts Peter, a Jew. Verse 15, you and I are Jews by birth. A Jew to a Jew. What's the point I'm trying to make here? Well, gents, guys, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that it gets super frustrating to, to some of our, our ladies when, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll say, hey, we're for women empowerment, we're for women equality, we're against gender-based violence, and we say, we stand for, oh, we hate it, we need to engage it, and then we gather together, and then we ask a woman to come and tell us yet again why this is an issue. Tell us again. Now, it's not to say that women are, are, are not capable or competent, they are fully capable, fully competent of unpacking all of that, many of that women, women in this very room. But, but guys, it gets tiring if we keep going, yeah, yeah no, we, we, we believe this, but, but would you come and tell us? To be honest, I think in most cases it's a cop-out. It's our way of going, if this goes badly, then what we'll do is we'll just say, oh, sorry guys, it was just that angry dot, dot, dot. My white siblings, the number of predominantly white churches that I've been invited to over and over and over again to come and, 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 and talk about reconciliation and, and diversity and, the, and how the gospel breaks down dividing walls of hostility and, and, and folks who go, we believe this, we're for this, come and speak to us. And then I go, okay, hold on, can I, can I rather talk to your leadership, which is predominantly, usually, predominantly white and male, and I go, guys, if, I want to talk to you guys because, because if you keep getting people of color to come and talk about this over and over again, it, it paints a picture, it sets the tone that you guys don't think that it's that important. And so it's a bit of a cop-out when, when it comes and then we try and it doesn't work and then we go, ah, oh, they just didn't explain it properly. They just weren't truthful and gracious. A Jew to a Jew. Because it allows us to be able, in our own context, to address the excuses so that we can get to the issues. It allows us as men to address the excuses so that we can get to the issues. The third thing I want to quickly show you here in verse 14. He says, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, what Paul does here is he raises this issue to a gospel issue. It's not a side project. It's not a if we get time, we'll get there. It's a gospel issue. And we should see it in that way. A gospel issue. Now I know that some folks will say, oh, no, you mentioned that it's racism, it's not because we're one human race. Okay, cool, I get that. Uh, some people find it better to say prejudice. And it's kind of weird because it's almost like they, they bring it down a level. It's almost like prejudice is the sanitized version of racism. Prejudice wears a mask and washes its hands for 20 seconds, and it's, it's not that bad. But it's not. Sin is sin. In fact, James, in James chapter 2, he refers to it as partiality, the sin of partiality, the sin of favoritism. And I would encourage you to go read it. He goes at length about it. He simply says, guys, don't do it. It's sin. And then in chapter 2 of verse 8, he then goes, you know, so, some of us, we try to rank these sins. I'll show partiality. That's okay. We can tolerate that. Yeah, but murder is a big deal. We don't do that. And he goes, if you murder and you show partiality in the eyes of God, 
with sin. This is a gospel issue. And we should treat it as such. Another place I want to take you to, again, to show you that we have a complex gospel that sanctifies, that, that is able to engage in our complex situations is in Matthew 21, verse 12 to 13. It says, Jesus went into the temple and threw out all those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. Now, I'm not trying to make this an absolute application. But what I believe the Bible tells us is that there are situations where we need to overturn some tables. Again, I'm not trying to start a violent movement. Please, don't quote me saying that. I'm not. We need a complex gospel that is able to engage in various situations where we need to figure out what it means to overturn some tables. Some people read this and go, well, Jesus must have gone on a temper tantrum. But he didn't. In Mark's account of this, we're told that he went there the day before, sussed out the situation, and then went back, probably prayed about it and said, God, how would you like me to engage in this? In John's account, we're told that he showed up with a whip. He prepared a whip, people. I know this is the Jesus that many of you are going, wait, what? A whip? A whip? And he overturned tables. He caused chaos here. There are times, there are times where Jesus will call us to go the extra mile. I wish I had time to unpack that story. But... To his disciples hearing that, they would have gone, Jesus, wait, what? There are times where we need to turn the other cheek. Ah, Jesus, just stop. Stop. Jesus goes, no, I've got one more. Love your enemy. We need the power of the gospel to be able to do these things, friends. And there are times where we need to overturn tables. Why? Why did Jesus do this? Well, verse 13 tells us. He said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. Now, I alluded in the beginning that, that the, the temple had multiple divisions. Let me set some context. Uh, the temple was built by Solomon. Then it was destroyed when the Babylonians took over. They completely demolished it. Then, when the Persians took over, uh, the king, I believe his name is Cyprus, uh, allowed the Israelites to go back and begin rebuilding. And so this project was begun by Zerubbabel. You can read about this in Ezra chapter 1. And over the next 400 years, depending on the leader, they would build, desecrate, build, desecrate, build, desecrate. And eventually it got to King Herod who then finished what Zerubbabel in a sense had begun. The rebuilding of the temple. But it was different. See, the original temple only had two courts. The courts of the high priest and the court for everyone else. Court of high priest is where they would go in and make sacrifices. Only the priests could go in there. The other court, everyone else. This new temple had multiple courts. It had the court of the high priest, then another court, which they called the court of Israel, which was for Jewish men, then another court for women, but only Jewish women, and then another court, the outer court, for the Gentiles for everyone else. And what was happening for Jesus to come in and overturn these tables and use the shambok is the priests had kind of established a relationship with some of the money changers and the local dealers and said, you know what, guys, if you pay us a small fee, you can set up your little stall here. I mean, it's, it's just the outer court. It doesn't matter. We don't we disregard these people. They don't mean anything. And anyway, they're not God's people. Just set it up. It's all good. And so Jesus shows up and he goes, what on earth is going on here? And so he quotes from Isaiah 56. And I'm going to read that to you. Isaiah 56 from verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Preserve justice and do what is right, for my salvation is coming soon, and my righteousness will be revealed. Happy is the person who does this, the son of a man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. No foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord should say, the Lord will exclude me from his people. 
and the eunuch should say, look, I'm a dried up tree, for the Lord says this, for the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me will hold firmly to my covenant. I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give each of them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. As for the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, there it is again. To minister to him, to the love of to love the name of the Lord and to become his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold firmly to my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. And here it is, for my house will be called a house of prayer for who? For who? How how did they miss it? It's because they chose to. They chose the desires of their flesh. They chose comfort over the gospel. And so Jesus shows up and he goes, this is not how it was meant to be. And so some some of us, some of us are going to have to go back to our spaces where we live, work, and play and pray to God and ask God, give me wisdom. What does it look like to overturn some tables? God, give me gospel power. Give me resurrection power. Give me boldness. Give me courage. Give me the words. Give me truth. Give me grace. Give me mercy to figure out how do I overturn some tables. Remember, friends, we have a complex gospel for sanctification. So whatever situation you're in and you're thinking to yourself, well, Ona, it's you don't know. I don't. But guess who does? God, who is seated on his throne and fully in control. I love Isaiah 56 because it speaks of the eunuch. In Acts chapter 8, we find the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. He's coming back from the temple, from wanting to worship. This Ethiopian eunuch is the minister of finance for the queen back in Ethiopia. So what was he doing there? Well, I believe he was going to offer up tithes and offerings as an act of worship and then he also wanted some time to worship but he comes back and, and, and he's not in a good space you read the text properly you'll see he runs into Philip which wasn't by mistake God had told Philip to go to a certain place because he's like I need you to engage someone there's an issue here among my people that I need to rectify so Philip's there waiting Ethiopian eunuch shows up he's reading a portion of scripture from Isaiah 53 not too far away from Isaiah 56 and he's like reading it and Philip sees him and he's like, hey, what are you reading? Ethiopian eunuch tells him, he's like, well, do you understand what you're reading? He's like, how can I if no one explains it to me? Uh-oh, you just came from the temple. Someone could have explained it to you there, but clearly they didn't. Why? Because you were in the outer court, denied access. And so he asks Philip, Philip, is this portion about Isaiah? Or is Isaiah talking about someone else? Great question. Let's unpack it. The text tells us that he started unpacking the, the scriptures from that point. And I believe, it's not there, but I believe that he went Isaiah 53. Let me tell you what it's about. Isaiah 55, and then he got to Isaiah 56. And he, there he says, hold on. It says here that even me, even me, if I surrender my life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, that I can also be a part of this family, this transcultural family, 100%. Acts 8, verse 36 the eunuch goes, so then what prevents me from being baptized? Something had prevented me where I've just come from. After reading this and realizing the richness, the the, the wonder of God and what he's doing, what prevents me from being baptized? Oh, guy got out the cart that he was in, got baptized, boom. Philip disappears, epic story. I want like a missionary story like that in my life. Like I showed up, preached the gospel and then disappeared. Epic Friends, we have a complex gospel that sanctifies. A gospel that that awakens us to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. I think some of us need to pray, God, as I read the scriptures, 
Would you open my eyes? We saw this in part one. It was Paul's prayer to the church in Ephesus. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord, so that as we read the scriptures, we might be blown away by the wonder of God and see his transcultural church. See, when we talk about being transcultural, I envision a community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context. No longer, no longer folks walking into communities of faith and labeling them by the color of people's skin, how much money they have in their bank accounts, their cultures, but rather to go, these are the people of God. There's a fragrance here of the kingdom of God that pushes beyond cultural backgrounds and, and, and how we vote and where we live and where we shop. Friends, I'll give my life to this. This is why we planted Rooted Fellowship because we are being obedient to what we believe we see in the scriptures. And, and not just to have a space here that's like this, but to multiply this. And so my hope is as you show up and go, yeah, I'm a part of Rooted Fellowship, you're signing up to that. To say, God, I want to be awakened to the wonder of who you are and, and your transcultural church in my life, in my workspace, where, where, where I hang out. God, I, I just want to, I want to see a multiplication of this. I am sacrificially going to give to this. Otherwise, we run the danger of passing on that which has been given to us. And for many of us, for many of us, it, it, it's not a complete gospel. It just isn't. Let's call it what it is. It, it just isn't. I want to close by reading from John. First John, chapter 4, verse 19. John writes, we love because he first loved us. Gospel. Gospel. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar, John says. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. Why would John say this? It's because we're created in the image of God. We are image bearers of our Father in heaven. And so if we go around going, you know, I hate these people. And I know, I know, educated people, 2022, those words would never come out of our mouth. Oh, but they sit comfortably in our hearts. You cannot say you hate your brother and your sister. You show prejudice, racism, unconscious bias. Friends, you can call it whatever you want. You cannot say you are like that to your brother and sister and then go, but I love God. What does John say? Not me. Not me. What does John say? You're a liar. We, we, as the church friends we can say a lot about society and culture and we should engage in the public space which many of you are beautifully doing you are ambassadors of the kingdom of God in your workplace, in your neighborhood in your school, yes but we've got to examine the church and if I read that text and I look at how things have played out that means that there were people who stood in places like me who were theologically astute studied at some of the best schools that money could afford but were liars that means that even today there are people who are in close proximity to us who are liars and I know that that's not an easy thing to say I know that But, but I don't want to be the person that makes people think that they have a relationship with God when in reality they don't. 
I want people to know that good news brings people together. The gospel brings people together. But here's the thing. Liars are covered by the same grace that murderers are. Murderers are covered by the same grace that adulterers are. The grace of God covers. And so you might sit here and, and, and go, I know some people. Or you might be sitting here and going, that's me. God's grace covers you. If you surrender your life to him through the simple gospel of salvation, the complex gospel of sanctification can mold you and change you and shape you. We'll stumble along the way, but he's there right beside you. This is one of the beautiful things about the church. It's one of the beautiful things about God's children. God is forming a family for himself from all people. Him as our king and us as his children. And while we may not be perfect this side of heaven, we point one another to a perfect savior seated on his throne, interceding for us and going, I'm with you every step of the way. And so my question is, will you join this mission that he is already on? Will you? And I don't want an answer now. It's something you're going to have to go back and, and pray and consider. And, and God, this is, this is huge. But will you? Because there's nothing more beautiful than God's church on display as she ought to be. Amen? Let's pray. And so, Father God, thank you for this truth. Lord, these are old, ancient words, but they are living and active. They can capture our hearts in any season, at any time, in any situation. And so, God, as we think about our very nation, we don't have to go that far. We think of the brokenness, the hurt, the pain, the guilt, the shame. We know those are real in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our circle of friends. God, we pray that you would meet us where we are the power of the resurrection that is able to save us is the same power that releases us to go into these broken spaces with the message of reconciliation. And it's not for our glory, but it's for yours. But as we glorify you, God, we find great joy in you. We're in desperate need of a Savior. That Savior's name is Jesus. And so, Jesus, would you save would you heal? Would you restore? Would you reconcile? In your name we pray. Amen.